I'm Dave Baker. And I'm Spandrew Spice. Welcome to Deep Cuts, the podcast where we pick a topic and walk you through the ins, the outs, and the nitty gritty, so you can appear like an interesting and idiosyncratic person at your next forced social function. Today's topic is... Dr. Peter Scott Morgan. Who was Dr. Peter Scott Morgan? The short of it would be he was a death-defying madman who took risk after risk as an act of both hubris and self-preservation. But that sounds a little too much like Evil Knievel or anyone from Jackass. No, Dr. Peter Scott Morgan was a robotic scientist who, in the face of terminal illness, decided to take everything he had learned over his illustrious career and attempt to turn that into immortality. Act 1. A scientist confronts mortality. The future is a broad term, something that could mean any time between five seconds from now and five centuries. Or even further, till time maybe circles back on itself like a snake eating its own tail. Generally, these are things we imagine. Flying cars, still waiting on that. Teleportation, hopefully without the existential question of whether we're committing suicide and being rebuilt. Or robot vacuums that can do the whole floor, including that black rug that it doesn't mistake for a black hole. More often than that, the future has always been a realm of science fiction, a shimmering destination that never quite arrives because of our slow steps forward into a continuous present reminding us the world changes every second of every minute. But for one man, the future wasn't just something to dream about. No, for Dr. Peter Scott Morgan, the future was something you built and then became. Can I can I say something very quickly? I every time you say Dr. Peter Scott Morgan, my brain has a Pavlovian response to Dr. and Peter in your voice. I expect you to say Dr. Peter Weller here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Dr. Peter Weller here. I mean I, I I wish we were talking about Dr. Peter Weller. Me too. Dr. Peter Weller, I'm just uh, here in Hawaii shooting episodes of Hawaii Five O, doing my cameos. Yeah, I, I I don't even remember. Why were we talking about that? Did we try and hire him over a cameo or something? I don't know if you're intending this to be in the show, but if for the listener, uh, we did a Buckaroo Bonsai episode um, that had a narrative element where we actually met characters from Buckaroo Bonsai that were played by the actors that played those characters. And that was a, an amazing opportunity that was presented to us uh, by friend of the show and guest on that episode, Dan Berger. And uh, so we ended up, Earl Mac Roush, the writer of Buckaroo Banzai, wrote a thing for us to do for the episode. And we got um, Pepe Serna and Billy Vera to play their characters from the show or from the movie in this thing. But before that, we before this opportunity arose, we were talking about doing a narrative thing where we met Buckaroo Banzai and all this stuff. And we were kind of discussing a scheme where we would kind of trick Peter Weller into being in the show by basically hiring him on cameo to like unwittingly do lines for the episode and then like slowly piece together a voice acting part from those. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I don't even fucking know the legality of that, but that was what we were going to do. Um, but his cameo is funny because he does the cameo clearly because he's trying to make money from it. But he also has this weird ego thing where he doesn't want to be thought of as somebody who would do cameo. So in every cameo he makes, because you can see them publicly, the, the cameos that people make for people, you can like watch them. And in every cameo he makes, he spends like 30 seconds listing off all of his credits and accolades and the fact that he's a doctor and then he like talks about some like film project he's working on and he like makes sure that you know that like Peter Weller doesn't need to be on fucking cameo he's like a legit guy but then also happy birthday Sarah (laughs) it's so funny too because every time he every time he does that intro it's Dr. Peter Weller here and I'm a direct, you know, director, and uh, also I. There's a dog outside my window barking right now, and uh, also I taught art art history classes at the collegiate level for ten years, and I played more than just RoboCop, Buckaroo Banzai, also Star Trek Into Darkness. Pretty big deal, Doctor Peter Weller. 
which is which is just totally him to uh i i saw a, a revival screening of robocop at the egyptian theater several years ago and there was a q a with dr peter weller um and i think that was it i, th- I don't think there was anybody else there um but he uh and you and you've seen that I, I don't know people have a lot of people that are interested in robocop or peter weller's work or whatever they they've seen like interviews with him on youtube and he's kind of this way a lot where he's just like always seems like he's like above the interview like he doesn't want to answer questions and people will be like you know what was it like being in the robocop suit and he'd be like ah i don't want to talk about that i want to talk about my paintings or something like that and like that was the way he was for the whole q and a he was just like dodging every question and acting like he was just too good to be there. And at one point he was literally just like, the only reason why I'm even doing this is because uh, Miguel Ferrer died and I'm just doing it because I just want to pay tribute to him, but I don't actually want to be here. He just like literally said that. (laughs) I mean, I feel like Dr. Peter Weller is the type of guy that would as a last ditch effort, freeze his head, try and become a cyborg do something weird like Dr. Peter Scott Morgan. Dr. Peter Scott Morgan. Yeah, he would do that, despite the fact that he made a movie about like that, the cautionary tale of how you shouldn't do that. <laughs> yeah, but it's almost like Dr. Peter Weller here uh, probably doesn't really under... Like, he's talked about Buckaroo Banzai before, and he's like, I still don't understand it, but, uh, you know... Though they were two nice boys, and they came to me, and they said, do you want to be Sherlock Holmes meets Elvis? And I was like, yes, I do. Yeah, so yeah, he definitely would freeze his head. When most people are told they're going to die soon, they typically go through the stages of grief, like Lincoln, Majora's Mask, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and eventually, acceptance. (laughs) That's such a funny frame of reference (laughs) to compare it to Majora's Mask. (laughs) I know, right? (laughs) Dr. Scott Morgan, however, took one look at that list and asked, is there a cyborg option? He didn't have time for acceptance. After all, the acceptance of death was a sign of complacency to a man who had been breaking barriers and assumptions throughout his entire career. As he put it in a 2020 interview, I intend to be a human guinea pig to see just how far we can turn science fiction into reality. That's both an amazing and kind of terrifying thing to state, right? Both in regards to himself and other human beings at large. On one hand, maybe no human should throw their hand up and shout, yeah, I'll give it a whirl, maybe just strap some hydraulics here. On the other hand, this is the story of a man who looked at the imminent collapse of his body and decided that nature and biology wouldn't fire him. He'd just quit. He'd build a better version of himself, one impervious to decay and death. And while this doesn't pan out exactly how he wanted, he still passed. He did something most of us outside of Discworld never consider. He said no to death. It's another... It's another, that's another deep pull of a reference. Before we get that far, though, we need to talk a little bit about this rabble rouser. Born in 1958 in Torquay, England, he had always been a forward thinker, a futurist in every sense of the word. No, Peter was a man who viewed the world through a lens of relentless curiosity, the kind of curiosity that asks, what if and why not? Um, and we got some we got some pictures of Dr. Peter Scott, Dr. Peter Scott Morgan here prior to, you know, what we'll get into in a little bit, his sort of deteriorating health condition prior to that when he's just kind of so uh, uh, kind of a weird looking English scientist guy. Uh, so what are we seeing here, Dave? Dr. Peter Scott Morgan looks like a rejected member of the touring cast of Siegfried and Roy. Dr. Peter Scott Morgan looks like he was a child singer in the 1960s, and he's just coasted off of the money he made from a one season TV show that he shot for the rest of his life. Dr. Peter Scott Morgan looks like the type of guy that says, but mummy, it's only got one stick of butter in it. Dr. Peter Scott Morgan looks like if you went to one of those machines that they have in like malls or whatever, I don't think they really have many more, but they used to back in the 90s where you could take a picture of two people and then combine it to like show you what your baby would look like. And they did that with Justin Bieber and just Britain. <laughs> Dr. Peter Scott Morgan looks like um, he looks like the 80s version of Peter Weller, honestly. Like he's very, he's like anorexic Peter Weller. If anorexic Peter Weller was a very well-intentioned but overly privileged scientist. 
yeah so he's 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 uh there's just like a photo of him where and this is kind of going back to my justin bieber reference he's just got a he's got like a strangely like he's like an older dude in his 50s but he just has that haircut he just has justin bieber's hair for some reason the 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 kid justin bieber the one where it was like the weird shaggy bowl cut one um and then he's and then he's standing here with a bunch of sled dogs he's on some kind of arctic expedition of sorts and then he's this is like a photo from a wedding it's his wedding i'm not sure it's no context there but he's clearly at some kind of wedding i mean that's obviously his wedding bro 100 percent uh i mean maybe I, he's not wearing a tuxedo so i just it's um i'm not I, I i don't know um it seems like it's his wedding if there's a picture of it but he's also not wearing a tuxedo um yeah and and you know as we start to get into this uh it, kind of just going back to what was said before um about this the idea of this um and obviously this is kind of the reason why we did this episode uh but i do find it incredibly fascinating and i almost i i want to almost say admirable but then there's there's a little bit more texture to it than that it's not just pure admiration but the idea that he like this this man found out he was going to die and he just went Fuck that. And not in the way that a lot of people do when they when they get a diagnosis of a terminal illness and they're like, I'm going to fight this. I'm going to do chemotherapy or I'm going to do this or I'm going to go and like, you know, I'm going to suddenly my brain is going to shift and I'm going to get into like Eastern uh, uh, holistic medication and think that I can be healed with like essential oils or something like that. Um, th that's like those are, I think, more typical responses of somebody either just hard, like doubling down on trusting the medical system will pull them out of it or like going off into alternative uh, medical options and thinking that something else is the answer. Um, but he's like, he's like, no, I'm going to Tony Stark my way out of this shit. Like, he's just like, I'm going to fucking build myself to life, which is like, which is like I said, it's like, it's, it's, it's kind of badass. I mean, it's not kind of badass. It's like definitely badass that that was his reaction and that he just he was just thought like I can use my intellect to to like build myself a better body. But also there's an element to it because, you know, he's like a robotic scientist who works for some like robotics company or whatever. And it's it's also like very much like modern tech startup bro. -y. You just think you can like figure it out and then. It's like, how, though? And it's like, I don't know, just gumption. And it, and, it, and you you referenced this term in a previous episode last week or the week before. Uh, I forget. But you you mentioned the the uh, the the, well, the like entrepreneurial bias or whatever. Entrepreneurial bias. The idea that like you you you're told like your whole life that you're never going to do something and you're going to fail. And then you have one br you have one success and because you've been told so much by everybody that you're going to fail it makes you think that you're invincible and that all of your ideas are gold and it actually makes you think that if somebody tells you you're going to fail it means you're going to succeed and then it causes this weird like this weird like reverse like reverse confirmation bias where you're like constantly if you just have the utmost faith in your own uh, judgment and disregard facts always. And you start doing increasingly more outlandish and unrealistic things that just over time just fail more and more disastrously. And you, but you like continue to double down because you think in your mind that you're like a god. This is just that. It, it, it like you you can sit here and be like, this is fucking awesome. This is so admirable that he had this attitude. But it's also just that. It's it, yeah, a hundred percent. Also, by the way, this person in the in the photo with him is his husband. Yeah, I, I, I figured it was I figured it was, but I just wasn't sure because he's not wearing a bow tie. That's his husband, Francis. They got married in 2005, uh, Francis Morgan. Um, and when they got married, they, they got together in 1979. But in 1990, they merged their last names because uh, his name is originally Dr. Peter Scott. Yeah, he has. A, and that's like a, that's something that I guess a listener probably just doesn't realize because they're not seeing it written on paper. But Dr. Peter Scott Morgan, that's not like his middle name. It's a hyphenated last name. Armed with a Ph.D. in robotics from Imperial College, London, Peter had spent much of his career trying to push the boundaries of what machines could do. 
blending the lines between man and machine. He was known as one of the leading experts in systems engineering, a field that is 100% as futuristic as it sounds. In the layest of layman's terms, it's a degree that makes you understand efficiency, to see the problems in something and round up a way to make it work cleaner. Peter's passion for understanding how things worked, and more importantly, how they could be improved, made him a pioneer in this field. But in 2017, his journey took an unexpected detour when he was diagnosed with motor neuron disease, MND, also known as amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease. MND is a cruel condition that systematically robs you of your ability to move, speak, and eventually even breathe. In short, MND is the sort of disease that doesn't care about your plans for the future. It's an eviction notice. The disease systematically breaks down motor neurons, which are essential for muscle movement, ultimately leaving patients completely paralyzed while their minds remain painfully intact. One of the things I like about this show and what I like about doing this show with you is that you know, we were constantly like trading ideas for episodes and sending each other stuff of like, hey, what if we did this? Or, oh, I really want to talk about that. And then even on top of that, like just kind of exponential curve of ideas that, you know, you don't necessarily initially think you're exposed to, but because someone is showing you something, it leads you down a wormhole and you learn about all this other stuff. Um, that's one of the reasons why I really like doing the show. But the other thing that I kind of hate about the show is that it constantly gives me new fears. I am now terrified of having this. <laughs> like, I didn't even know this was a thing. I mean, I knew Lou Gehrig's disease is like a disease that is named, but, and I think I'm probably aware that it is a thing that can happen where you can become trapped in a prison of your own mind and your body just says, no, fuck you. But like, it's so terrifying. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, that the, you know, the uh, ALS, um, it's interesting to, to be discussed as this other term that's less common, but ALS is like, that's that condition that they, that the ice bucket challenge was designed to be a benefit for that thing that got really viral in the late, in the late 2010s, like a, like a, like a pre COVID world where we were just like, let's just fucking dump water on ourselves. This is weird, meaningless expression of solidarity for this disease that is killing people um because you know a, a disease will never affect me i'll never have to deal with that it's some poor sucker that i've never met that has to do this um so i'm just gonna i'm so bored with my life and existentially uh just lacking in experience that i'm just gonna dump ice water on myself as some attempt at endurance uh the but yeah that's that that's that disease um it it's uh it killed uh, notably uh, Steven Hillenberg, the creator of SpongeBob SquarePants. But yeah, it's it, it is it is totally absolutely terrifying. Um, I don't I don't know. I, I there are other there are other conditions that are similar to that that cause a similar effect in other ways. I, there's something called locked in syndrome, which I don't know if that is the same thing as ALS or it's a different thing. But ultimately, it's a thing where it's like you're body can't move you're in total paralysis from the outside it just seems like you're basically just in a coma but you're just awake and, and conscious and your brain is functioning normally so you're just sitting there and you can't move and you're just you know fucking going insane i guess nah i'm good nah thanks though yeah there, there was a there was a there was a horror story about that where i read once where a guy died, but his, but he stayed conscious, and he was like his body was like in a, in a morgue or something like that, and he was just he was just conscious, but he couldn't see. No, he could see. Yeah, yeah, he could see. He could feel. His body was was conscious, but he could he he was dead, but he couldn't move. And then he was just like praying for them to finally cremate him because then he would just no longer be alive. Uh, but then they they slowly started cremating his body parts. So then his like vision went away because they burned his eyes and he was like waiting for them to finally burn his brain so that he could just be free from like consciousness. And then they put his brain in a jar. And then it was just like, he had to just live as a brain in a jar for thousands of years and he just like went insane. And that 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 story was just horrifying to me. Yeah, I'm good. Thanks, though. Everyone deals with mortality in wildly different ways. Some would receive that diagnosis and fall into a deep depression, a resignation that there was nothing left to do save count down the time. 
Others might suddenly develop a bucket list and quickly try to cross off every single item while their body allowed. There's an expression describing the end of something as going out with not a bang but a whimper. It's clear from what Peter did next that he was not a whimper kind of guy. If MND was going to try to take his body from him, then Peter was going to build a better body. Not just one that would outlast the disease, mind you. Oh no. Peter wanted to create a body that would transcend death itself. Which is funny that uh, you thought you you thought that I was your your mind went to Dr. Peter Weller because he he just literally is trying to become Robocop. Yeah, pretty much. Prime Directive one. Smooch my husband. Prime Directive two. Do not die. Yeah, you gotta you gotta smooch first. Yeah. I mean what's the point of living if you're not fucking smooching, you know what I mean? Yeah, if you, if you can't do if you can't smooch, then just like just let just fucking kill me. Act two, turning yourself into a cyborg, a user's guide. So how exactly does one go about becoming a cyborg? Can you order the necessary parts online, or do you have to get involved in some shady back alley dealings with renegade robotic engineers? I, I just got to quickly say, and I, I should have said this earlier, but I just forgot about it. But this episode idea has been on the back burner for so long that when I first proposed we do this episode, he was alive. God damn. Since then, now that we finally got around to doing the episode, He's he, you know, spoiler alert, we kind of mentioned it before, but he died. But but when we originally were going to do this, there was kind of no end to the story yet. So it's I guess it's good that we waited as morbid as that sounds. Uh, but um, there wasn't an end. It was like, is he going to become a cyborg? Because he was still alive. It was like a thing. He, it was a thing he was trying to do. And, uh, you know, we. He, we, he wait, we waited so long that now there's an end to the story, unfortunately. Unfortunately, there's no definitive guide on the subject. No step-by-step -step instruction manual for how to become part human, part machine. But if anyone was going to write that manual, it would have been Dr. Peter Scott Morgan. When Peter decided to embark on the ultimate life upgrade, he did what any self-respecting scientist would do. He started with research. And the first thing he realized was that if he was going to live beyond the limitations of his failing body, he might as well start with his voice. According to Peter... I really want, when I'm locked in, to sound a bit like me and convey some of the emotion and hopefully gain a bit of the empathy from the people in my current state. Without that, I think I'll feel very isolated. Because that loneliness is scary, especially for someone like Peter, who had been with his husband for over 40 years, that simple idea of your partner no longer being able to hear you say, I love you, is something hard to get over. And Peter is not the kind of guy to get over something as much as barrel through it. And I think, you know, it's funny that he touches upon this. I'm I, I, I'm obviously no expert on this situation because, number one, I'm just not an expert on, like, human biology or human psychology or mental health. And I also am not a living cyborg. Uh, but I think this would go much deeper than what Dr. Peter Scott Morgan was kind of touching on here. He's, he's saying, like, I would need to be able to speak with my own voice because I feel like if I wasn't able to like connect with people that I love, I would get very lonely. Um, but I think that it, that that problem would become much bigger than he is could possibly even fathom. Um, my assumption is that uh, once again, not an expert, maybe someday somebody will prove me wrong. Uh, but my assumption is that if you were to successfully like remove a person's brain from their physical body and cre and implant it into a cybernetic body that has been created that basically allows your brain to continue functioning so that you're conscious and you are you, but you just have a cybernetic body. My assumption is that you would go insane and go into a deep depression, even if you could see, even if you could speak and communicate. I, I think that Dr. Dr. Peter Sp Scott Morgan is severely underestimating the the human mind's necessity for having human organic tactile physical interaction with the world and i think that if you were in a robot body where the only way you were able to communicate with the outer world around you is by this synthesized voice and like fucking robot arms or like tentacles or some shit i think you would get so depressed that you would want to be killed yeah 
I wonder too if that's like in that scenario does the human brain need to sleep if so how does it sleep when like does it artificially turn off its vision sensors and then like you know like I'm yeah I don't know I was thinking that same thing of like I wonder if like are you gonna like is this gonna become more of a feasibility now with these like Chinese AI body robot things that are being manufactured overseas haptic feedback suits robotic limbs that respond to minor twitches and muscles for amputees like it feels like we're like very close to somebody being like I'm terminally ill I'm gonna die fuck it try and put me in one of those things make me a robot I mean they tried to do that head transplant a couple years ago I don't know if that I don't think it succeeded I think that guy died but there was a dude somewhat similar story to this he had a neurological condition where his whole body shut down or maybe he was paralyzed I don't remember which and he was you know just fully non ambulatory other than you know his head and so he was like i'm he volunteered to be the first test subject for a head transplant um surgery uh it's funny because i I mean i I almost i almost thought maybe we should do an episode about it but number one it's like very similar to this and also really there's not like as much to it it really is just like he said like i'll i'll do it i might as well give it a shot and then he did it and it didn't work that like there's really there's nothing to it. Like this story has like this the origin story of a fucking t- Tony Stark inventing a robot body, but that that's really kind of all that is there is to that story. Um, but it is still really interesting, and I, I I I remember reading about it when it first was talked about, like when he said like I'm gonna do this. Um, but actually, recently I just watched like a 20 minute long YouTube explainer video about it, um, and and the video was basically talking about how like at least with our current medical capabilities, transplanting a head is just physically impossible. It can't be done because there's so many connections that need to be made that we just literally, we couldn't physically do it. And it was talking about the fact that they've done experiments for for years and years with attempting head transplants because that's like the final frontier of transplant medicine. We can give you a new arm, if we if it's done correctly, we can give you a new leg. If it's done correctly, we can give you a new heart. We can give you a new everything almost, but we just can't give you a new body uh, entirely. And so they've done all these experiments. There was a there was a scientist who put a dog's head on another dog, and the dog the dogs like lived for a couple days. They like he successfully quote unquote I'm doing air quotes transplanted a head of a dog onto another dog. It was alive, but it wasn't, it was just by alive, it was breathing and its heart was beating. It was not conscious, it couldn't move. And then this other doctor put a monkey's head on a different monkey and the monkey was conscious. And it even like one time somebody like walked towards it and it like screeched at him, but it couldn't move its body because the issue is just like, there's just, we can't like, fucking connect we can't connect up all the little shit that you need to like do it it's like impossible i mean i think it's gonna be very quickly not impossible yeah like i said that's just with current current medical capabilities it's just not something we can do but of course like maybe with a combination of ai and those like really fine robotic incision things that i've seen where they can like cut a hole in a piece of corn and then sew it closed like maybe with the combination of those things, like we'll we'll be seeing some head transplants. Maybe 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 they'll put your head on my body, and I, and I'll put my head on yours. Dude, that'd be trippy. Cause like if we had the option, we'd do that, right? Oh, a hundred percent. Just for the novelty of it, like you know, just have like a weekend at Bernie's. Like, hey, let's switch heads, and then we do that for like a couple of days, and then meh, you want to switch back? Okay. Yeah, cause do do a face off situation. Cause the cause the thing about the thing about face off that just just isn't actually realistic in real life is if you put like Nicolas Cage is this sort of like he's a tall slender man with like an angular bone structure and John Travolta is a short guy with a round bone structure and and he's got a larger frame he's like a bonier guy if you put Nicolas Cage's face on John Travolta and vice versa you just have like a weird looking dude 
that had like John Travolta's body and then like a tiny little Nicolas Cage face swimming in the middle of his giant head that like kind of looks like Nicolas Cage, but it also has John Travolta's bone structure. So it would look like both of them at the same time in a weird way. You'd have to do the whole head. Honestly, what you need now is to remake Face Off, but using deep fake technology and actually deep fake each other's faces onto the other actor's head. You know, like just remake every shot in John Woo's seminal face off. But with the with the current day, John Travolta, chunky John Travolta and like weird angular, like, you know, thin Nick Cage, but actually put their faces on each other's bodies. Yeah, I mean, that's an idea. But I say remake face off. But it's you and, and me and we and they surgically switch our heads. But we do it in real life, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll be like one of those, uh, like, Tom Cruise stunt, you know, Mission Impossible porn things where it's like, you won't believe he jumped off the Burj Khalifa. And it's like, you won't believe these two idiots actually swapped their faces. And we're like, we're in the movie and we're just like clearly in excruciating pain. Like the surgery technically worked, but like, it's just awful we're just like we're just like in agonizing pain. Our, we can't use our bodies correctly. We're just like fucking Cronenberg fucking slabs of meat shambling around. Disgusting. <laughs> so with the help of some very clever people, he developed a solution, a synthesized version of his own voice. I've, we're going to watch. We're going to listen to a little bit of Dr. Peter Scott Morgan's synthesized voice. Dr. Peter Scott Morgan here. Which, uh, spoiler alert, way better than Stephen Hawking's synthesized voice. I don't know why he didn't upgrade that shit. Human. Let's talk about your voice and avatar. Tell us more about how they work. Since my paralysis and subsequent surgical procedure to keep me breathing, I've lost my ability to speak, at least in the traditional way. Communication has therefore become one of my biggest challenges and priorities. As you can see in this conversation, you're not talking to the Peter of old. You're talking to Peter 2.0, the new me, the real me. This avatar has been developed to help me to communicate with the world, to help me to talk and engage in daily conversations. A digital version of me that'll show my emotions, laughing, smiling, Winking, it'll even eventually show my signature move, raising one eyebrow. Our focus is to ensure full synchronization, meaning the voice, lips, and expressions all work together to express the same emotion. Before I lost my biological voice, I recorded over 20,000 words to help train Peter 2.0. I also had my face scanned to make my avatar a true reflection of me. We captured super high resolution, so once computer power catches up, I'll soon be able to use a photorealistic avatar, indistinguishable from a biological human. That's when it'll become really interesting. I think. Yeah, and it's crazy because like this was this was back in um, I don't know this this whole thing is happening like 2018 through 2022 when he died. I don't know at what point this particular stage of this voice synthesizer avatar thing was um, but it's crazy that even since then even even if this was 2018 I think this is actually later I think this is more like 2021 or something like that but even if it was 2018 um, or even if it was 2021 uh, just since even then the advancement in the like now like you could have a version of your voice that just literally sounds exactly like you with like human inflection and everything like that like, this is like, it sounds like, it kind of sounds like his voice, but it's also like a speech synthesizer, and you can tell that it's a robot. But now, like, if you heard some of these, like, chat GPT voices and, like, these AI clones of voices, like, you could just, you could just have it sound exactly like him. And that's all, it's only been, like, a couple of years since this. In fact, there's definitely been multiple times in this show where... For a couple lines, you were hearing an AI version of my voice because there was a thing I said wrong or something like that, and I didn't want to go re-record it, and so I just 
generated myself saying something with AI, uh, and you did not notice. It's so scary. It's so scary. This wasn't just any computerized voice. It wasn't like the robotic monotones we hear from our GPS systems or those customer service robots that always insist they understand us, but never do. No, Peter wanted a voice that felt real, a voice that could sound like him even after he could no longer physically speak. Through advanced voice banking and some technological wizardry, Peter's new voice was born, and it was as close to his natural voice as anyone could get. This wasn't just a survival tool, it was Peter, preserved in digital form. Because while Disney and movie studios shuffle back dead celebrities without their family or estate's consent ad nauseum, here was a man who was happy to have his face scanned in order to have a digital avatar of himself that he hoped would one day emote and have what he called his signature move of raising one eyebrow, which is a classic for anyone. But voice and avatar were only the beginning. After all, what good is speech if you're trapped inside a body that refuses to cooperate? Enter the exoskeleton. This is what we've been waiting for, baby! The T-800! Hell yeah! Yeah, he, he just builds himself a fucking just T-800, just fucking Arnold Schwarzenegger body. License it, licenses it from, from Arnie. Now, when we think of exoskeletons, we often imagine something out of a sci-fi movie. See Ripley and Aliens or the entire cartoon Exo Squad. Something sleek, shiny, and probably with lasers for eyes. But for Peter, the exoskeleton was more practical a tool that would allow him to move, communicate, and continue living, even as his body failed. But that's not really what would happen. He developed a wheelchair he could control with his eye movement, a tech similar to what Stephen Hawking had that would allow him to rise when he needed. Of course, the exoskeleton wasn't the only upgrade Peter had in mind. As motor neuron disease advanced, he would lose the ability to eat and drink in the usual ways, so he had feeding tubes and other systems installed to keep him alive. He was, in a very real sense, turning himself into a living machine, with each piece of technology keeping one more aspect of his humanity alive. Peter's ultimate goal was to become Peter 2.0, a version of himself that wouldn't just survive ALS, but would transcend the limitations of biology altogether. It was an audacious goal, one that blurred the lines between man and machine, between life and death. Here's my, here's my question. How is he paying for all of this? Like, this has to be like, like, how much does this cost? I don't know if it's mentioned in here, uh, but I do remember when I sort of found out about this story and was reading about it years ago um, that it definitely like I think the framing of the whole story was this man is spending millions to become a robot. Um, so he's like he I mean, I, I'm, he's rich and he's just he's he's super rich and he's just dumping millions of dollars into this. So he just had like a really extremely successful career pr prior to this as a scientist and engineer or whatever, and that got him enough money to like build a new body. Like Jeff Bezos isn't even trying to spend his billions to do this. Like what? You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I mean, I think uh, there's a couple things there. I think the first thing is, um, I mean, rich people definitely are doing things like this. Uh, they are putting money into like cryogenic technology and, you know, uploading their minds to a computer like they are investing in people developing these technologies. So it's not that it's not happening. I, I think it definitely is. Um, but then also uh, the, the second part of that is like, oh, but, you know, he's literally building a body for himself to like fucking move his brain into. Why aren't you know, why isn't Jeff Bezos doing that right now? Why isn't he? working on having a robot body built that even though he's not dying, but that when he does die, it can be moved in or whatever. Um, and I think the probably the answer to that is like, I think for even super rich people that are obsessed with not wanting to die and wanting to throw their money at staying young and living forever. I think that the concept of like building yourself a robot body for when you die is just too existentially morbid of a concept that I think most people would not like venture into that territory. Like Dr. Peter Scott Morgan had to because he's dying. I don't know. I could be wrong, but if I was a billionaire, even then, like I just don't know if I could. I don't know if I could like literally build myself a digital coffin. Like that just that just seems too existentially traumatizing. Yeah, it's pretty fucking dark. Yeah, and yeah, and and you know the other the other thing about this, which I'm sure this is in the last time this will come up is you know it's just like the the existential and you know almost transhumanist questions that this brings up 
Um, I know, I, funny enough, I, I just brought this up on a previous episode, um, one or two episodes ago, uh, the idea, I, I referenced that that movie, The Tenant, uh, where he's saying, like, you know, if if you cut off my arms and my legs, you know, I'm still me. But what happens whenever you cut off my body? Like, is my body still me or is my head me? At what at what point do am I no longer me anymore? Um, and this is like this is just really that where it's like there's a lot of there's a lot of unanswered questions about what is what would actually take place if something like this happened. Like if you completely removed your brain from your body and successfully implanted it into a robotic body or even a different body, is that you anymore? And you and 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 Dr. Peter Scott Morgan is slowly like replacing aspects of his humanity um, with other things. He's getting tubes installed to feed him, so he's no longer eating like a human being anymore. He's got a speech synthesizer. Um, he's you know using you know a, a wheelchair that he manipulates by blowing on it to move. Um, you know all these things individually. You know, they seem like, you know, just the normal augmentations that you'd use to account for disability. You know, people use wheelchairs, they use crutches, they um, use prosthetic arms, they use speech aid uh, technology. These are all normal things. And, you know, you're still definitely you if you have to use a wheelchair or if you have to use crutches or if you are no longer able to speak and you have to use sign language or some kind of speech synthesis thing. Um, But as these things start to stack up, and he's slowly, re- one by one, replacing every aspect of what he is as a human being. You know, at what point is he no longer Dr. Peter Scott Morgan? And I think I think that the, the thing that people are arguing or the thing that I think that he's definitely arguing is that I am my brain. Put my brain in a new body. But, you know, is that true? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 the quintessential thought experiment of the ship of Theseus. You know, if you have a ship and you replace every piece of wood that is built, that builds the ship one piece at a time, at what point does it stop being the Theseus and what point does it start being a new ship? Yeah. And and that that's that's what's very t- terrifying to me. It was referenced earlier in the episode, but the idea of like teleportation that I, I actually I wrote a I wrote a short story about this, actually, because it is a very terrifying concept to me. I wrote a short story. It was a short science fiction story about um a future society where they they fig they figure out teleportation and it like revolutionizes everything because you know you can if you can teleport anywhere immediately everything like so many things become solved or changed uh just you know travel getting from one place to another is the obvious one but then there's also like you know shipment of goods and then you know that changes the economy cuz suddenly you don't have to have truck drivers and ships and all these things you can just teleport things across the world and it, it, it fundamentally changes society for the better. And it's like this utopian society. But then at some point, somebody finds out, they discovers that the company that developed this teleportation technology, it, the entire time, they knew that the way the technology works is when you teleport, you are destroyed. And then a new version of you is created at the other end. So... All these people that are getting up in the morning and going to work every morning, they're dying every day. And then a different person is being created that has their memories, but it's not them. They're dead. And then that's happening every day. So these people all find out like, I'm like, I'm like the 3000th fucking iteration of this person. Um, And the reason why I I wrote that is because I, I always kind of get obsessed with that whenever I watch any movie that involves like cloning or or um or not cloning but uh teleportation or like or like creating another version of you like that that movie the what is it the 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 sixth day um with Arnold Schwarzenegger where uh they when someone dies they they get brought back to life as a clone um and when I watched that movie I was like they never reference it in the movie, but like, I was like, but yeah, but the, the, the original person is dead though. Like that's not them. That's a different thing that looks like them and has their memories, but that, that other person died. And that's, uh, that was so disturbing to me. That idea just disturbed me in my core. The idea that like, 
you would think that you were going to be rejuvenated or teleported somewhere and then you just fucking die forever and then some other thing just carries on your life that's just really scary to me um and that's and that's the same thing with this it's like the 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 ship of theseus where it's just like you know it like at what point does he just become another thing like yeah it's his brain but maybe there's something to do we don't know we don't fully understand the biology of this it's un it's untreaded territory so like maybe there is something fundamentally of your consciousness that is the combination of your brain and your body and if your brain was put into another human being's body you would just be a different person that just had like the memories of the person that they were there but you were not the same consciousness you were some different thing well i think that's also especially interesting when thinking about ideas of gender or sexual orientation or gender expression like if you put peter scott morgan's brain into a heterosexual man's body does that change does does the natural impulses that his brain brings to it alter what the shared kind of muscle memory that the individual has what happens if it you know the only body available was a woman's body or a woman's brain was put in a man's body yeah which is why that's which is why i said it 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 raises questions about like you know transhumanist philosophy because that's exactly it like there are there are things about you that aren't just your brain as much as that's kind of what we say it's like and there's that meme where it's like we're we're brain we're we're actually a brain piloting a meat skeleton or a meat uh robot or whatever that's like the thing that people say as like a as like a funny thing of like you know because all all of all of our the, the feelings that we have in our body pain and sensations it's happening in our brain and it's being conveyed to those areas by nerve endings and things like that and so you know the thing that people say is we are our brain and our bodies are just kind of like this vessel that you know helps us to move around and do things i don't is that true because as you were just saying if if there's something you know if you were put into a woman's body and you don't feel like you are a woman you feel like you're a man you fundamentally changed a massive part of your own identity or even just the even just the experiences that are housed within the muscle memory the you know the nerve system that we live in you know you you hold on to those traumas and they manifest physically for people right so if you let's say you were fortunate enough to never have those traumas but then you were put into a body that did have those traumas that you know experienced violence or experienced you know going to war and uh, you know the post-traumatic stress of that you know phantom limb syndrome you know like all of these situations like how does that manifest if your brain is divorced from that history are you inheriting that history and it manifests for you not that you would know like oh yes i was in iraq but like are you experience cravings are you experiencing panic you know that's unexplainable to you i i have no idea but it's a fascinating thought experiment yeah and it's 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 terrifying enough to 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 make you kind of feel like you just wouldn't even open up that can of worms by opting into it like it's it's it, the the unknowns of that are so terrifying that i really wonder if i was given the option of like you're about to die but we can put you in this other body or we can put you in this robot body if i would even go for it because of all of the unknowns it's it's like it's almost too terrifying to even because then once it happens, it's like then you've opened yourself up to whatever horrors are on the other side of that. There There's a there's a book series uh, called the Bobaverse. It's like the sort of colloquial name for it. Um, and it's uh, it, basically the the first book in the series. This guy named Bob, uh, he goes to this company that will make an exact digital replication of your consciousness. And if you die, it'll bring you back to life. And then directly after finalizing the process and walking out of the company's building, he gets hit by a car and dies. And then he wakes up, I think like 3000 years in the future. And he's, uh, he's 
uh, an artificial intelligence in a computer. And he finds out that over this 3000 years, um, this like far right theocratic authoritarian regime takes over the United States and they outlaw um, this technology of like replicating consciousnesses because they think it's like against God. And so they seize ownership of all of these backed up consciousnesses and then they're overthrown by a different government, like, like, a, like a corporate government. And then the corporate government takes ownership, takes ownership of all of these consciousnesses. And then they basically uh, bring them back online to like run machinery. So he gets woken up to run a Zamboni at a fucking skating rink. And like, he thought that he was like preserving his consciousness to be brought back to life as a person. But then he wakes up and he's just like a slave to some corporation that's like forced to run a Zamboni. And like, that's fucking terrifying. And you're and that's like that you, you opt into something and it's like you don't know what's going to be on the other side of that. You like Walt Disney has no fucking idea what would happen if one day we finally figured out how to bring him back to life. He went he went out in 1968 thinking maybe one day you can fucking make me alive again and I can build Epcot. But for all we know, or for all he knew, he could get brought back to life in like 3042. Well, that's the thing that I always think it was really funny about the Walt Disney thing specifically, because I'm like, what does Walt Disney think when he comes out and it's somebody's like, oh my gosh, Walt, you're such a Rizzler. Skibbity. Can you airdrop me that, Walt? Can you can you air, airdrop me your... Uh, you know, your digits so we can stay in touch. Do you have a snap? Like, I can't, I can't picture Walt Disney being like, only fans? It's also funny because like, I mean, I don't know exactly the legality of this. If like a person who owned a company and then died and then brought back, like, but like, I feel like if he was brought back, it's not like they'd be like, all right, Walt, you're the head of Disney again. He would just, he would just be a guy. Like, they're like, no, like, it's been, it's been fucking 80 years like we're this i'm the ceo of this company like there's a board of directors like you have no control of this at all like you can be like a mascot i guess like we can like fucking cart you out at d23 or some shit but like you're like you have nothing to do here just go home he only is able to do that like two or three times and then he drops the hard r n word in one of those and they're like well <laughs> sorry walt Yep, it would be it would be a limited run. It would be one it would be one appearance. Well, anyway, the concept, we could talk about it all day because it's fucking horrifying and we don't know the answers. So we can just we can just spin our, spin our wheels all day about this. But instead, we're going to go to Act 3. The Cyborg Ethos Peter's quest to become the world's first human-cyborg hybrid wasn't just about prolonging his own life. He saw this transformation as part of something much larger, something that could change the way we think about humanity itself. To him, merging with machines wasn't an abandonment of his humanity, but an extension of it. It wasn't about leaving behind what made him human, but about enhancing it. Why should we be limited by our biology, he wondered, when technology offered us the chance to rewrite the rules? And this idea that technology could augment, even transcend human limitations, wasn't as radical as it might seem at first blush. People already do lots of things that go against our original programming. We fly in planes, we dive deep into the ocean, we explore space, and we create technology that can access every piece of information humanity has ever collected. These are feats that our biological ancestors could never have imagined, and yet they are everyday realities for us now. But as I said before, I would argue that I just really think that like the tactile experience of human physicality is probably a significant component of our mental health and all these things are all these things are different because like yeah flying through the air on an airplane is fucking horrifying and every time i do it the entire time unless i just completely distract myself by playing video games i'm just like why am I doing this? This doesn't this isn't natural. Why am I in the air? Why is this happening? Why do people do this? Why do we invent this bullshit? This is not right. We're not supposed to be doing this. 
the whole time. It's fucking horrifying to me, but it's still me as a body experiencing that. In many ways, Peter Scott Morgan was just taking this concept to its logical conclusion. If we can already use technology to enhance our abilities, why not use it to overcome our limitations? Why not use it to defy death itself? In interviews, Peter spoke not of fear or resignation, but of excitement and curiosity. For him, becoming a cyborg was the logical next step for mankind, not just for himself. If machines could help us live longer, healthier lives, why wouldn't we embrace that? And if machines could one day help us escape death altogether, well, wasn't that worth exploring? As Peter put it, What if this technology could help millions live fuller lives, despite disease? There's a reason the vampire myth has persisted as long as it has, or why the Highlander franchise refuses to die. Some people just want to refuse to die. When you look at what Peter Scott Morgan did, it's clear he didn't view himself as a victim of motor neuron disease. He saw himself as a pioneer, a man who was bravely stepping into the unknown, armed with technology and the sheer will to survive. Where others saw limitations, he saw possibilities. But despite his many technological upgrades, Peter Scott Morgan passed away in June of 2022 at the age of 64. But to say that his death marked the end of his journey would be missing the point. Peter didn't see his life as a failure because he eventually died. He saw it as a success because he had managed to live so much longer and more fully than anyone expected. When he was first diagnosed with motor neuron disease, doctors gave him only a few short years to live. But Peter defied those predictions. He continued working, speaking, and pushing boundaries long after the disease should have claimed him. And this is a, this is a picture of him sort of like towards the end of his life with his husband. Um, they're in a hospital room. He's sort of hooked up to this, you know, wheelchair machine that is also like this speech synthesizer uh, rig that he had. It's a little, it's a little sad. I mean, I, I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm, I'm actually kind of tearing up a little bit. But he, this was like late in his life, about to die basically. But he does not look like a person who has been defeated and is like, you know, just kind of coping with the last circling of the drain before. Uh, a disease claims them. He looks like somebody who is hopeful. Yeah, he really does. He really does look like uh, somebody who's very content with what they've been willing, what they've uh, accomplished. You know, in this photo, he's very like he's in a wheelchair. His husband's there, and they're both smiling in this hospital. And you know, I'm sure that there's horrific sadness and emotional torment, at least on his husband's part, behind those closed doors. But, you know, they're both uh, united against the yawing maw of uh, impending death. And I and there's something very, you know, sweepingly romantic about that, right? They've been together for 40 years. This guy, so they, they merged their names. This guy supports him, you know, through this objectively unconventional way to go out. I mean, it's 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 very impressive. Powerfully sad, but there is something there is something that fills me with a odd sense of pride for the human condition and the spirit of being alive and the celebration of being alive in like just this photo and like the look on his face. Because like I said, usually when you see pictures of people when they're sort of clutched in the grip of some terminal illness, it's obviously just like wreaking havoc on their body. They've been told they're going to be dead within, you know, a few weeks or a few months or whatever it is. Even if, you know, they're smiling, they're, there's always this like wistful look on their wistful look on their face. And maybe it's you kind of projecting a little bit, but it always feels like, oh, you know, they, they seem like they're just they're lost in this haze of like a human being grappling with the idea that they're going to be dead. Like, I, I think that would be hard for anybody to cope with. Um, like you will be dead. I mean, everybody knows they're going to die someday, but you know that it's going to be like in like three days and you're like lost in that that's that's probably so hard to fathom and you can always kind of see that in people's faces in photos when you look at them and that's just not there he just looks like you said content he lived on his terms thanks in part to the technology he had embraced peter's legacy then isn't about the fact that he died it's about what he accomplished in the years leading up to that moment he showed us that it's possible to push back against the limitations of the human body, to find new ways of living even in the face of certain death. And while he may not have achieved full cyborg immortality, he came closer than anybody before him. What's more, Peter's work opened up a new frontier for science and technology. 
His quest to become Peter 2.0 wasn't just a personal journey. It was a scientific experiment, one that will undoubtedly have lasting implications for future generations. The technologies he helped pioneer, everything from voice banking to facial avatar animation, will continue to benefit others long after his passing. His journey wasn't just about surviving ALS, it was about challenging what it means to be human in the first place. And that, perhaps more than anything, is the true legacy of Peter Scott Morgan, a man who refused to let death have the final say. So did Peter Scott Morgan become the first true cyborg? Yes, but not in the way that sci-fi imagined. His journey didn't result in immortality, but it did redefine how we think about life, death, and the interface between man and machine. His story leaves us with more questions than answers, which is exactly what Peter would have wanted. In the end, maybe the goal isn't to defeat death. Maybe the goal is to use whatever tools we have, whether they're flesh and bone or metal and silicon, to live on our own terms for as long as we wish, to push the boundaries of what's possible. And maybe that's what being human or cyborg really means. Well, how do you feel, Davy boy? You you researching robot bodies? You know, I it's it's interesting. There's a part of me that is curious about that. Like there's a part of me that is fascinated by it and a part of me that I just look at, you know, I like a while ago Jimmy Carter had his 100th birthday and there were a bunch of videos of him and his family taking photos on the front lawn of his house and he's in a wheelchair. But it's not like the wheelchair where, you know, somebody's sitting in it and looking around and they just can't walk. It's the type of wheelchair that's like a bed on wheels, you know, and he like his mouth was open and he was just like obviously like his body was failing because he's 100 years old. Yeah. Or that that video that has become a meme on TikTok now, that video of George Bush Sr. like throwing the first pitch at a baseball game. And he's just like, he's not there. Like, he's he's not there. And he's just holding the ball. And then he just, like, lifts the ball up. And it's like, that, that body is just going through the motions. He is not there. And, like, so, you know, there's a part of me that's interested, like, at that point, does it make more sense to throw yourself on the proverbial existential pyre and take a swing? I don't know. I don't think I'm going to be in a position where I'm ever going to have enough money to really be able to be faced with that existential crossroads. But it's something that's very interesting to me and something that seems as technology evolves rap- more rapid and more rapid paces that it's 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 coming soon. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll never get the option, but that's something we can talk about because we just didn't talk about that through this whole thing. But definitely something that I wanted to bring up which is, and you kind of answered it a little bit, but maybe expand on it. Like, how do you feel about that? Because the thing is, is like, you always hear this. It's in movies. It's like a very romantic thing for a character to say. And also you hear people say it in real life where they're just like, you know, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to live forever. I I want to, you know, I want to die when I'm supposed to die or whatever. Me personally, give me that immortality, baby. (laughs) Like all those things people say, like, oh, you know, I just wouldn't want to blah, blah, blah. Nope, I'm good. Live forever. I'll do it. Sign me up. Yeah, I feel like I. Uh, but yeah, how do you how do you how do you feel about it? Because I because I always think about that. I always people I always hear people saying that. And I'm just like, nah, I, I'll, I'll take it. I want to live as long as possible. I don't want to die. <laughs> yeah, I'm like I'm like 50 50. There's a part of me that's like, yeah, I kind of would really love to see what that brave new frontier is like. And then another part of me that's like, yeah, I don't know. Like the, the, you know, the beginning and the middle and the end of a life gives it meaning, you know, but I will say that I kind of love the idea of being a weird bodiless brain in a jar that just has the ability to make things and isn't, you know, shackled to the mortal coil that requires nutrition and sleep and you know showers and eating and paying rent and like you know there's the it, it, there is there's like a there is a part of me that's interested in that and then there's another part of me that is thinks exactly what you were talking about of like not being in a body not having those tethered that tether to earthly responsibilities i don't know it just seems like that can get out of hand so quickly yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking about in the most base level, 
like not even that big of a deal term. I'm just thinking about the like like when you're trying to like help somebody solve a technical problem on their computer over the phone and the 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 fact that you're not there and can't use your hands to like manipulate the device to figure it out is like it 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 makes me feel physical pain. It's so frustrating when when you're trying to do that for somebody and you're just like oh, if I was just if I was just there I could just do this but ah just even that makes me want to fucking die. Um, imagine like you just don't have a body. Yeah. Yeah, I think it would be really hard. Um yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't necessarily think that there's something after death though. So there's a there's a component of me that's just like fuck it, roll the dice. Better to have that option. It's either that or just like oblivion, just like nothingness. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's 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 how I feel about it. And I, I also similar to you and maybe even more so than what you just expressed. I just real the idea of like missing out on. Well, there's two things. One of the things is it's hard for me to fathom just one day disappearing and no longer getting to see where this all goes. And I mean that just in every sense of the word technological advancements, what the fucking new iPhone's going to be like in 80 years. Also, just like society as a whole, where we're evolving, what's going to happen? Are we ever going to make it over a hump into like a utopian society? Like, like all is like I can't. It's hard to really fathom that I'm not going to be able to see that at some point because because, you know, a human we're we are kind of designed to look back and be like, man, all those fucking idiots in the past didn't get to see this cool ass bullshit we got. Um, and the idea that you're going to be one of those people is hard to cope with. It's hard to think about. Um, so there's that. And also and also on a more personal level. And I think about this all the time. This is not I'm not just I'm not just fucking pulling this out of my ass to talk about in this episode. I think about this all the time. But the idea that I will die and I can't I can no longer protect my children and they just have to face whatever the fuck is going to happen in the world without me is 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 incredibly depressing so that those for those two reasons i i really just very strongly kind of just be like kind of just feel like just just give me give me that death becomes her juice well on that note i'm dave baker and i'm spandrew spice this has been deep cuts if you'd like to find me on the internet you can do so at heydavebaker.com you can also find my book mary tyler moorhawk or Forest Hills Bootleg Society, or Everyone is Tulip, wherever you get your books. Any books. They're there. Mary Tyler Mohawk is a girl with a plan. Uh, what Spantru is referencing is that he was fucking around with uh, an AI song generator and made a theme song for the titular character of my book, Mary Tyler Mohawk. And, it, like, I look, fuck AI. Fuck AI so much, but... It's scarily good. <laughs> it's scarily good. You should play it. Play it. Play it. Play it. We'll just put it here we're at the gonna, end of the episode. We're going to play it. Yeah. You don't have to do it over your phone right now. I just mean like after after we do the plugs. So if you want to hear this Mary Tyler Moorhawk theme song, it'll play. Spandrew, where can people find you on the internet? You can't find me on the internet because I exist in the void of consciousness and my only connection to the world is a uh, cybernetic body that I've built for myself. Uh, but if you want to get pay res your respects to the dear beloved Papa Pricey, who just is fully dead, he never got to the robot body part. Um, you can get his book, Deadbolt AI Private Eye, which is also about a robot body, just it, layers upon layers here, guys. Um, it's about a robot detective living in the future who solves crimes. Um, you can go to dapricerights.com to pick that up, or you can go to uh, my TikTok channel, which I'll plug in a second, and I'm selling it because I'm just I'm just a good guy like that. I'm just selling his book for him. Um, if you if you like to if you prefer to use the TikTok shop over the website, uh, you can follow us on social media by going to Facebook and searching Deep Cuts Podcasts. Search the Deep Cuts Podcast Facebook group where we're in there. We're talking about the show. We're making memes. We're doing other cool stuff. You can join our Discord server, bitly.com slash Deep Cuts Discord, where we talk about the show, make memes, play games. Sometimes I give you little sneak peeks of things that other people don't get to see. You can follow us on Instagram at Deep Cuts Pod. You can follow us on TikTok at Mystery Treehouse. And you can follow me on TikTok at Dead Boy Detective, where I make fun little fact videos and other random stuff that goes viral sometimes. So clearly somebody thinks it's decent. 
enough to watch. Um, and you can also pick up some comics and some other stuff I'm selling on there. Check it out. Deep Cuts is a production by Boy Genius Media. If you'd like to find this show and others like it, please visit boygeniusmedia.com or deepcutspod.com. If you want to join in on post-episode discussions, please join the Deep Cuts Podcast Facebook group. Finally, subscribe to our YouTube channel for additional video content. The incidental music for this episode was created by D. Catalano, whose music can be found at wekeepoddhours.bandcamp.com. This episode of Deep Cuts was guest written by Adam Smith.